wonderful as we have an opportunity each week to come and worship with the band. And I know that um, God's a good God, isn't he? Amen. Let's give him a round of applause just for who he is. Um, you know, beginning next week, we're going to three week emphasis, um, not so much on preaching, but uh, even though I will be uh, delivering a message next week on the seven enemies of our faith, and we'll be looking at isolation and how that can be combated. But one of the ways that we can do that is through small groups. I know people think, well, we're a large church, but we're also a small church because we have small groups. And it's the old um, Sunday school that some of you remember. We call them small groups because sometimes we have them during the week and most of them are on, on Sunday morning. Now, we're going to have booths out here, tables set up with classes out there that are going to be talking about, talking to you about their small group next week and the next three weeks, actually, and uh, something for every age group. So we want to challenge you to check that out, to come early, uh, to stay a little bit or stay a little bit later and check that out. And also, uh, the classes are going to be available to you next week to come in and uh, check them out. They're going to be expecting you. They're going to kind of roll out the, the red carpet, you might say, for you. And uh, you're going to know that you're not going to be the only one there that uh, is uh, maybe a guest. Sort of give you uh, an, uh, an idea on how you can kick the tires a little bit. Because, um, you know, the Bible teaches us that, in fact, I believe, at least, that we need to have a congregation. We need to have, you know, the, the whole celebration service that we're having now. We also need a cell group. And that's our small groups is where ministry uh, comes. They minister to you. We know what's going on in your life when you have a crisis because of the deacon and the, and the leaders, Sunday school uh, or the small group teacher knows about you. And as you tell them, they tell us. And so that's how the ministry goes on. Of course, they minister to one another, most of all themselves. It gives you an opportunity to serve as well. So some of you are not ready for Discover uh, Cross Life, which is our uh, membership class. You think, well, I'm, I'm just not ready to join yet. Well, you can still become a part of us by enrolling in a, in a small group. And, you know, no obligation. It's just an obligation to us to keep up with you. Uh, on, on your crisis experiences and not uh, an obligation to us. Chance again to kick the tires a little bit, take the next steps in inquiring about the church, inquiring about Christ. So let me in, invite you to do that beginning next week. It'll be an exciting time. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. I want us to take our Bibles this morning and we want to turn to the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be looking at the balancing life's demands and the, really the, the enemy of busyness in our life. Now, we know that we have people-oriented people in here today, but we also have a lot of task-oriented people, a lot of people that do a lot of work, and, you know, just knowing all this uh, that's going on in life, we want to accomplish, and I, I preach this so many, taught this so many times, we want to accomplish everything we can before we die. And if your life was like a clock, and you are, we'll just say, uh, 20 years old, then right now you would say that your life is at 6 a.m. <coughs> On the other hand, if, if it's high noon in your life, halfway through, uh, based on 80 year life, 40 years old. If your life was like a clock and it was 6 p.m., guess how old you would be? 60 years old. And you say, well, thank you so much for that pep talk, Pastor. I really appreciate that. You know, well, the Bible says number your days, but, you know, we have so many things, so many tasks in life to do. There's taking care of the family uh, and there's the, the vocation, the job that you have sometimes feels overwhelming. In fact, your boss demands so many things of you. And then there's um, things like recreation in your life. And there's also church activities that you can be involved in. So we, we do all these things. We try to balance them out, but it, they just seem to be overwhelming to us. And we feel kind of defeated in that, do we not? Do we not? Yes. Yeah. Just because we can. I thought that was really cute of them to do that. Um, we have all, all these things to do and we still feel like, oh, we lost the game. We're losing the game. You know, I read this past week that the the average person a day sleeps two hours less than their grandparents. 57% of us in America do not take all of our time off, all of our vacation time. And so we feel stressed out. We feel that 
at work where, where just so much is demanded of, of us. Then when we get home, more is demanded of us. And then we have all the children or grandkids or whatever to take care of, especially the kids. You know, somebody once told me, he said, you know, when, when my first child is born, it's not going to change my life. <laughs> yeah, right. And he was talking about his, his class always being late to, uh, to his small group. And he said, well, we're, we're about to have our first one. It's not going to change our life. He struggled. I mean, he came in with a sweat every Sunday morning just getting ready for that. It, they change your life. Somebody asked the difference. One guy, oh, what's the difference between having three kids and four kids? He said, well, the fourth one's like this. You're in an ocean drowning. And you're just trying to keep your head above but water one last time. And somebody comes along with a little boat with a baby in their arms and says, here, catch. <laughs> you just feel kind of like you just can't do it all. Well, we're looking at a story this morning and knowing, by, by the way, of all the things that I could talk about, I can't even give transparent information today for my life. I'll tell you why. All these other seven enemies we're talking about, if I told you, which I did, I think, tell you, that, man, I struggle with answer, unanswered prayer as well. You say, oh, pastor's being transparent. Or I, I said, well, I, I study with stress or whatever uh, in my life as well. And, uh, oh, the pastor's being transparent. But if I were to tell you, hey, folks, this week I worked seven days. I just had, you know, everything piled on me. Everything was coming along, all this stuff. I'm just working, working, and working. You say, oh, pastor's bragging. Why? Because in America, we always overestimate, by the way, usually overestimate the amount of time we're working. And when you interview someone, I don't know how many people do this, but I, I have to do interviews sometimes o over the course. And, and I always ask the question to somebody, what is the biggest weakness of your life? And 100% of the time, without ever, without fail, the answer was, I work too much. Why? Because that is something that adds values to our, to our life. We, we think to ourselves, if I'm at lunch and I take that phone call, oh, I gotta take this call. Man, he's busy. He must be valuable. And we take on our, our self-worth to ourselves and we think to ourselves, I'm, I'm valuable if I'm busy and if, I, if people don't feel like I'm busy enough, I'm not doing my job and I'm not, just not valuable. Blaise Pascal, a philosopher, said this. He said, more people, he said, busyness sends more people to hell than unbelief. Well, that's not true, but it has truth to it. So let's look at this passage as we look at the life of Martha and Mary, a little scene in their life, and we ask, answer the questions, why are you so busy? Why is it an enemy? What can you do about it? Real simple. Thir verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her, to, tell her then to help me. <clears throat> but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, not the only portion, but the good one which will not be taken from her. So why are we so busy? Well, I want you to notice something here about Martha's life. She was a type A personality, but God was not, Jesus was not criticizing for her for her personality, not criticizing her for her task rather than people-oriented skills. But he was, he was talking to her about something that was innate in her. The best thing was Jesus coming along and having a chance to sit at the feet of Jesus, but she was busy working. Now, let me just say this. It, it doesn't matter who was there that day. It doesn't matter whether it's Jesus, one of the disciples, a stranger coming into town. It was something that people just did. They were, they were hospitable. If you were not hospitable back in this day, the neighbors would hear about it. And so Martha was worried about her task all the time in this way because of the work that was involved and, and the reputation of her family was involved as well. But she had the opportunity to do something that was better. And so why, why are we so busy? Well, one thing, just like Martha, 
We want to please other people. We want to look good. We want to play the hero maybe in somebody's life. That's the reason we exaggerate maybe about the work hours that we do or, or talk about it or brag about it in some way. We want to please other people and therefore we think to ourselves, if, if I really talk about my busyness or people think I'm busy, wow, I'm really valuable and they're going to think better of me. But there's also other things like fearful of others. We, we don't want to look like a failure. Martha wanted to look like a success. And some of you parents go through the same thing. And, and there's a trap involved here as you try to keep up with the Joneses. Now, I know that when we think about that, we think about the car we drive, the house we live in. I'm not talking about that at all, even though that could apply. I'm saying that we want to please people and want to look good in other people's eyes and we're, we're fearful of them and we really bring our whole family into the picture. And what I mean by that, we see people on Facebook. I'm not against Facebook at all. I think it can be a really good thing. Social media, a really good thing. However, one study I read recently said that Americans are more depressed today than they've ever been, and they put it to the feet of social media. Because people look at social media and see these pictures of these happy people, and they think, wow, I wish I were that happy. And you do, you know, you see your friends there on, some people are like masters of this. You would think their, their life had no problems at all. Always had their family together, always smiled. They're at Disney World, they got the little Mickey Mouse hats on. They're taking, you know, the, the photo. They're down at the beach. You say, wow, man, I haven't been to Disney World a long time. I, I'm not a good parent. I need to get down to Disney World. And so you go and you put the little beanie caps on, you wrestle with the kids trying to get them to take, take the picture. You throw it off, say, what do you want to do next? Okay, you can't make up your mind. I, I'm, I'm dying of sweat here, let's go. You know? <laughs> or, or you're down at the beach and, and you see these pictures. Of, oh, they're so happy. They're down at the beach. Well, I haven't been down at the beach in a long time. And you hear your, your, your uh, friends talking. Well, my, my kids are involved in a traveling team. Yeah, mine too, mine too. Oh, I'm the only one. Now, my son happens, you think, my son happens to be good at music, and we've got him in music, but, and he's not that good at sports. In fact, he doesn't even like that that much. He likes it, but not, not great. But we're going to put him on a traveling team, too, because if we don't, we're not going to keep up with everybody else. We're going to be the only, we're going to be the only bad parents. Or these people over here thinking, well, you know, I've got to buy a musical instrument for my child, even though he doesn't know which end to blow it in, you know, to the air, you know. Has no musical talent, tone deaf, totally, but you got to keep up. I'm just saying this to say, you don't have to keep up. I'm trying to set you free here. You don't have to keep up. Every child has, has their gift, and you need to go toward that giftedness. I was reading something the other day, and this really surprised me. In fact, it kind of goes against some of the things that I've always believed. A professor at George Mason University, Brian Kaplan, who conducted extensive studies on biological twins adopted by different families. And so the study was identical twins adopted by different families, and he found this. And his research showed is that all the things that the parents had their kids involved in had little or no effect on what the child achieved or how they turned out, assuming, he says, the home environment was stable. Kaplan cites a study where kids were asked to grade their parents' comment uh, on what they uh, would do better, what their parents would, wish they would do better. Rarely did the kids ask for more time, but they did say they wished their parents were less stressed and so prone to anger. He goes on to say, kids suffer secondhand stress all the business we are pouring into their lives to add value are actually crushing both them and their relationship to us. So why do we do it? Well, we do it to add, everybody thinks I have value, but also everybody thinks, hey, I'm a good family person. I'm doing things right. But we also, we stress ourselves out. And, and this is part of my thing. I don't want to miss opportunities. I've, I've talked about that before, and there's a balance here. But I've, done, I've read studies where when people will ask at the end of life, what do you regret the most? It was missed opportunities. So we don't want to miss an opportunity, so we grab at everything that comes along maybe. Another reason is we're just caught up in success. You know, we want to be better. We want to be the best. And that's kind of a prideful thing, really. And so we, we work, 
prove our value. I'm a, I can brag about it. I've got all these things going on in my life because I am a valuable person. Now, why would that be the enemy to us? Why? We look, at, we look again at Martha's life and her dilemma. Look in verse 40. Notice the stress. But Martha was distracted. What does this word mean? In the original language of Greek, where the Bible was originally written, this word comes from the word to be drawn and quartered. It's a stress, an anxiety um, word. It, it's the same word used when Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life worth more than food and the body more than clothing? And he says to us, look, all these things are going to stretch you out. Now, this word comes from the word being drawn and quartered. And what that means was, you know, there's a couple of ways several ways of the Romans executed people. One was on the cross, and we know about that one because Jesus died for our sins on the cross. But another one was to be drawn and quartered. It was very quick. A horse tied on to this hand and this arm, or, or this leg, and another horse tied on to this hand and this leg. They said, giddy up, and they went different directions, and you were split down the middle. It means to be double-minded, to be split. Martha was split. Why was she split? Well, she, want, she, she wanted to be at the feet of Jesus. She wanted to be there so bad to worship with him. But, and she was frustrated because she couldn't let the task go. She couldn't let it go. She had to finish it. She had to do it right. Because that would add value to her life and reputation. She couldn't let it go. She, so she was frustrated. It says... And in this verse, it says, distracted and much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister was left uh, me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. She was frustrated. She was frustrated with Jesus. Jesus, you need to tell, you need to correct my sister. She needs to get um, up from where she's sitting. She needs to come in to the kitchen and help me like she normally does. Now, Martha was the leader of the whole thing, but Mary, I'm sure, helped her most of the time. She was frustrated with Jesus, frustrated with Mary. Doesn't she know that I'm, man, I'm slaving here over the stove? I mean, she needed to be hospitable. I'm not saying that, but peanut butter and jelly sandwiches would have been just fine with Jesus, I think, rather than a seven-course meal. And so she was frustrated with Mary, but she was frustrated with herself because she longed to be at the feet of Jesus, but again, she couldn't let it go. She just couldn't. It was the way she had made herself, so she was frustrated. We're all so tired. Look in verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. He says you're, you're anxious. Again, the stressed out, the tiredness it mentions here from being the stressed out. We go to, we go to bed tired, and we wake up sometimes more tired than we were before. The Bible says this. Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early and go to bed to, late to rest, eating the bread, not of toil. It's not talking about we shouldn't work. Listen, your boss demands things from you. I understand that. Your family needs things from you. I, I get that. I've been there, done that. But anxious stressful toil for he gives to his beloved sleep. Do you sleep? Hebrews tells us that the Christian life is characterized by rest for we who have believed enter that rest, peacefulness, a rest of the soul. But here we see that she's tired and also, Jesus said, troubled. Trump thrown into an uproar. So what about you? Are you always in a hurry? Are you? Hey, listen, I, I can remember a time when my kids in the back seat wasn't talking very long. Must have been maybe six months old, you know, talking already, you know, just really advanced. No, <laughs> just like yours, you know. No, maybe two, three years old. Hurry up, Daddy, we're going to be late. Hurry up. I remember that. And it was funny at first you suddenly realize, where did they get that? Hello. Is your to-do list too long for the day? Have you been told more than once to slow down? Do you feel guilty? Oh, here's a big one. Do you feel guilty when you relax or take a break? 
The whole idea was she was going to miss the one thing. It says in verse 42, but the one thing is necessary. Now let me ask you something. Suppose Jesus came today and he was just going to sit right here on the steps. What would you do? You say, well, Pastor, what would you do? I can tell you what I'd do. I'd make sure if I knew he was going to be here, I'd study my sermon a little bit more. <laughs> I'd make sure I had it down pat. I mean, after all, isn't Jesus here to critique me? Maybe Tim would say, oh, you know, if Jesus were here, man, our band would practice a little bit more. We'd take an extra night. No. I'd close up my Bible, stop the sermon, and say, go listen to it online if you wanted to hear it, because it's in the first hour, and I'd sit at the feet of Jesus just like you would. Because he's the one thing. He is the one thing. So what can we do about it? I mean, after all, this is a serious matter. You've got your boss pulling at you. You've got, you get home, you get your kids pulling at you. Maybe your spouse as well. The church is pulling at you. I mean, my, my goodness, they're, they keep talking to you about having a devotional time with God. Who's got time to do that? Coming to church, and you say, I'm coming when I can, but I'm busy. You've got things pulled in every direction. How in the world do you handle that in rest and peace? So what can we do about it? Verse 42, it says, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken from her. One thing, whole idea of Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is the rulership of God in your life and his holiness and righteousness, right living in your life. And all these things that you're so anxious about will be added to you. Wow, that's quite a statement. The closer you get to Jesus, the more in perspective you can see things. And that's so important. How can you make good decisions on what you should do and shouldn't do unless you have the right perspective? If you're dizzy all the time. I remember uh, growing up near Athens, Georgia, in a t little town called Bogart. And I went to Bogart Elementary uh, in my early days. And we had a merry-go-round. You know what that is, right? Am I, am I talking to you? Okay. All right, and, and in our merry-go-round, I remember it painted red, wooden, wooden base, and you had this hub in the middle. And then you had these bars, five or six of them coming out, metal bars, and they, they, they were rooted or grounded in the wood, and they would come around and grounded in the hub. And the idea was for you to hang on for dear life, and then somebody else on the outside kind of push you around. Real slowly, real nice. We didn't do that. As soon as the teacher wasn't looking, we would get out there and first run. You know, we'd all jump off and run it around and get it going as fast as we could and then do it with our foot. In fact, because what we wanted to do was hang off. <laughs> and we, man, it was, it, was, it was crazy just going down there. And then it was so much fun to let go. No, we didn't do that on purpose, but it ended up that way. <laughs> and we were rolling on the ground. But I found also another thing we did when the teacher wasn't looking is get close to the hub, get co close to the, the place it turns. And when you sit down on that thing, you just sit there. No problem, maybe hold on a little bit. So much smoother. The further away you got from the hub, the tougher it was. You know, it was like a wheel. If the hub, and which is Jesus, is if the hub of the wheel is right in the middle, the rest of the wheel is going to turn so smooth. But if it's offline in any way, Boom, boom, boom. It's just going to, you're going to feel it. You're going to know it. Just not there. And so it all has to do with Jesus. And at the feet of Jesus, there's healing in our hearts. Folks, here's the thing. When you get close to that, that hub of the merry-go-round, you begin to see Jesus for who he is. And you begin to see yourself more and more for who you are. And then God can reveal to you in your heart why you feel you have to drive yourself so much. Why? You'll find out. I can't tell you. But you get close to Jesus and you can. Also, at that hub, we learn, at the feet of Jesus, we learn from Jesus. Why is that important? We need wisdom to know, how can I prioritize my life? What am I supposed to do about my priorities in life? 
And the Bible tells us we, we really do those according to our callings. Ephesians 4.1 is just an example of our salvation. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to what you have been called. We're called to many things. The first thing is the salvation experience. That first thing is our relationship with God. My goodness, if you're going to chop down trees, what, you know, somebody said, well, uh, you know, how, what would you do first? I'd sharpen my axe. And somebody says, well, you're just talking about the quiet time again and going to church again. It's all, you know, I don't want to hear. Let me ask you this. Who, who would leave off fuel in life? Fuel. And food. Well, here, here's a young lady. We're going to show you on a video that had a different idea on a radical approach to saving time. See what you think about it. We all know life is busy. And today... On 45 Minutes West, I'm with Elaine Sellers, and we are here to see how she saves time to keep up with life. Well, I tried everything, but with the kids and their school activities, their sports practices and games, their band practices and performances, church activities, travel teams, my job, my job at home, I just couldn't keep up. So what did you do? Well, I just stopped eating. You just stopped eating altogether? Yep. At first, I tried drive throughs but I still had to wait in line on the average of 13 minutes, and there was all this trash in my car. I found if I just stopped eating, I didn't have to cook, I didn't have to clean or take time to eat. It left me with more time to work and drive the kids to all their activities. And what about your family? Well, they had to stop eating too. And how did that work out for you? Well, first of all, you would not believe the amount of time I saved. And then I was a little weak and I had a couple headaches and maybe I was a little irritable. Pick up your clothes! Ugh. But then after a couple days, it wasn't that bad for the next couple of weeks. And then? Well, then I got a little tired and weak and then I died. I guess that was a little advertised for our Angels and Demons series coming up tonight. <laughs> and you say, well, that's ridiculous. Nobody would do that. But yet we do that spiritually, do we not? We think, well, I know I, I've got to face all these problems in life, but I'm just going to leave off talking to God today. I'm going to leave out. Talk no, nobody does that. Nobody does that on purpose. But it's not a priority. We just don't, we don't read the Bible. We don't pray. We don't, we think, I'm going to leave off church. And we, we leave off the food that is going to bring us closer to the hub and bring, leave out the food that's going to help us to understand life and what we say yes to, what we say no to, because we don't, maybe we don't trust God with our time. You know, some of you here, in fact, many of you here are, and I'm, I'm going to mention the, the bad word, okay? It's going to be a bad word, tithe. Many of you give 10% of your money to the church to the ministry. Now, some of you do that just automatic. In fact, some of you do it online. It's just automatic. You don't even think about it. It's just part of it. But when you started doing that, you had to come to a place in your life and say, God, I've got all these bills to pay, but somehow I trust you to take 90% of my income, and I believe you're going to stretch it further than the 100% if I'd have kept it all. And you believe that, and it worked out for you. Why can't we believe that with our time? Now, I'm not saying that God would require 10% of your time. That'd be 16.8 hours a week. But what about 15 minutes a day for a quiet time? For a time when you get together with God and read the scripture and say, okay, God, I'm about to face the day. I need wisdom to know what to do. Would you, put, would you help me to work on your projects and not my own projects? Would you help me and help my, even help my employer to know what to give to me and what to take off my plate? Would you help me in saying yes or no to the kids? Would you help me, God, and bless me while I work? And all of a sudden it takes 5% of your time to do that. Go to, you go to church, small group, maybe you serve in some way. And all of these things are like fuel, food, 
Even the, even the serving because you're, you're excited about helping somebody. And it fuels your spiritual life. And from that, the 95% of your time that's left goes further than the 100%. And that's what Jesus is saying here. The first thing, the thing that is the hub that runs the, the rest of the show is seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things are going to be added to you. And so there's a, rela- there's a calling to a relationship with God. There's a calling in your family. Yeah, there is. There's a calling to family, to be the guys to be the spiritual leader of your home, ladies to, to, to not only support that spiritual leadership, but be a leader also of your ch- children as well. And, and men are passive. We, we are. Because we, we get it so much in, in work. Work, work, work. We bring, bring it home in our mind. You know, we think about it all the time. All of a sudden, well, there's a decision to make in a family. Well, honey, whatever you think. And then sometimes it's, honey just says, well, kids, what, whatever you want. Because she doesn't want to put up with all the emotion and, and all that that goes along. And, and, the, and the young people are like, hey, I, I think I know what's best for me. And, and the only way I can get, get things done is to is to be loud about it, maybe. And so everybody's kind of there because nobody is there at the feet of Jesus. Even a church. You know, one of the things we, we've seen all across the country in this generation is the young people choosing the church for the parents. Now, let me say this. I, I agree with Andy Stanley, a large church. You've got so many other things for young people to do. And I appreciate our young people here. And, you know, if you were here this past summer when they did the service by themselves, uh, you would know we, we've got a dynamic uh, group of young people. And uh, our children are great as well. And uh, wonderful ministries here. But the best thing I, listen, the best thing I can do for you is not to provide the great minister of ch- children, which we have, but the best thing I can do to you for you is help you grow. Because you're going to spend a lot more time with your young people than I will, or our church will, or our youth minister will. And so you choose the church at the basis of the whole family, including yourself. And then there's a calling to vocation. What has God really called you to do? You can't do it all. You've got to decide in vocation or even ministry in a church what you're called to do and what you're not called to do. I remember talking to the uh, president or the chairman of the Florida Baptist Children's Home a few years ago, and uh, somebody had requested that I call him and say, well, could you do this? So I called and said, yeah, we have requests for that every once in a while, but we can't do that. We're not equipped to do that, and sometimes you really have to decide who you are and who you're not, and that's true, and Jesus helps you do that when you draw close to him. Then finally, you find the rest in Jesus. You know, the healing and the learning but boy, just as important, maybe more importantly, it's just the rest. Let me read Psalm 127.2 to you again as I close. It says, It is vain for you to rise up early and to go late to rest, ending the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Now, this le- I've underlined the last two words because in the original Hebrew language, and this is in some of your translations. It says, he gives to his beloved even in their sleep. That's literally what it means. It means that God is going to bless you even while you're sleeping. Even when you're not doing anything. If you're the beloved in the Lord. And the beloved in the Lord, of course, is a believer in Christ. But it's really more than that. In fact, in Deuteronomy, in the Old Testament, it says, The beloved of the Lord dwells in safety. The high God surrounds him all the day long and dwells between his shoulders. You know what that means? The beloved of Yahweh. That means the Yadid. The Yadid, special word, of Yahweh, the beloved of the Lord, rides piggyback on God. Piggyback between the shoulders. I remember um, before we moved here, we lived in Norcross, Georgia. Um, I was pastoring a church there. We planted a church, pastored there for about nine years. And there was a park, really nice park, in Lilburn, which is a kind of a neighboring town. 
And we would just drive three, four miles over to that park, and they had a nice playground, and they had a, a, a half, a quarter mile track. And so I, I'd run around there several times and run, walk, whatever, and uh, the kids would play, and uh, Pam and I'd take turns kind of watching them. But every once in a while, my, my boys wanted to run around the track with me, but my, my daughter wants to get involved as well, you know? So uh, she wants me to ride her piggyback around the track. And so I would do this. I'd pick her up, put her on my shoulders, about three, two or three years old, and I, I would jog around the track with her on my shoulders. Now, that's hard. That's a labor of love, I'm telling you. And you can imagine at the end of the quarter mile, even being in my 30s, I was huffing and puffing. And I said, uh, honey, I, I think we need, we, <laughs> we need to rest. And she says, no, Dave, let's go around again. I'm not tired. <laughs> and you see, when we ride on the shoulders of God, we do the work but we do it in his rest. We do it in his power. We do it riding between the shoulders of God. And even while we're not at work, even while we sleep, he's blessing our life. Are we riding between the shoulders of God or are we just letting Satan distract us and frustrate us in life? Blaise Pascal said, busyness sins. More people to hell than, than unbelief. Just too busy to inquire about God. Too busy for the gospel. Too busy to go to church and hear about the gospel. And maybe that's your case this morning. Maybe you truly do live that busy life, as many, many people do. And you're thinking to yourself, you know, I do need a center again. I need a Lord of my life, a master of my life that will give me wisdom. I need someone to guide my life. The key is at the feet of Jesus. And so if you've never received Christ into your heart, I want to give you that opportunity to do that this morning. Maybe you're here, sitting here this morning and say, yeah, I, I've never made that decision. Today needs to be that day. Don't waste another moment of your life being out there with the toil of anxiety. Rest in him. Let's bow for prayer. As our hearts are quiet before the Lord, if the prayer of your heart is to receive Christ, to make a commitment, a surrender in your life to him, would you pray this prayer with me silently as I pray aloud? Lord God, you're right about me. I'm a sinner. I've sinned just like everyone else, but I have sinned. And that causes me to go off into a way of toil and anxiety and stress. And so I come to you confessing my sins. I come and sit at your feet and ask you to come into my life, making me the person that you want me to be and giving me rest and peace in my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to have an invitational time. We're going to ask you to stand in just a moment. I want to ask you right now, guys, if y'all stand up here. This is our part of our staff. Our ministers here doing a great job in our church. They're here to help you. And if you pray to receive Christ this morning, I want you to come during this time that we stand, and I want you to take them by the hand and just say, I prayed that prayer with the pastor. Other people here, you know that you just need to come to the place in your life of being satisfied with what God would have for you. Imagine in yourself, imagine if you could do what God wanted you to do, leave off the things that God wanted you to leave off each day, and then at the end of the day, smile and say, I'm satisfied, and I'm satisfied with Jesus. Maybe you need to lay some of those things at the altar and pray that God would would embrace your heart with this message today to set you free. Altar is open. We invite you to come and pray. But if you made a decision, you need to talk to someone. You come and talk to one of these three guys this morning. As we stand together right now, we're going to sing. You come. Who oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with 
the precious blood of Jesus Christ to oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Cause Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, oh come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ will oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We're going to continue to sing in just a moment. But let me just uh, encourage you right now before we pray. Uh, the welcome card that you received this morning as you walked through the door. If you would take this, we've already asked you to fill out the front of it. But on the back, it has some responses. My response to God's word. And uh, that will help us just to pray for you. An encouraging word from you. What God's done in your life. Maybe a prayer request. We, take the, we, have a, we have a bundle of those every week, and we faithfully are praying for you and your, and your request. And then on the upper right-hand corner, it says, My decision today, I've decided to surrender my life to Christ and begin a personal relationship with Him. If that was the decision of your heart this morning, if you receive Christ into your heart, pray that prayer with me. Put a little check in that box. Make sure it gets in the offering plate when it's passed. We'll get, make sure you get the literature that you would have received to help you grow if you would have come forward this morning. So we want to we want to do everything we can to help you in that. Let's go ahead and pray. God, thank you so much for all that you've given us. And God, thank you for your word and for the ability to worship. I God, I pray that we go out here with joy in our heart, knowing that we've learned something that is practical, that if we put it to practice, uh, you can really change our life and give us a blessed life. I pray, God, that as we receive the offering today, I pray that you would just open up our hearts and we would give generously from our heart, knowing that what we're giving is going to help individual people all throughout the world. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd blessing upon that offering today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.